Avast, ye mateys. Transmitting higher top of Florida's peninsula at 108 feet. This is Alpha Mike, and you're listening to Raider Cop Podcast, episode 124. Today's podcast is about the commission case. And I know that's not probably what you were expecting according to our last podcast episode, but we'll get to that in a minute. Before we uh, continue... How do you get in contact with us? RaiderCopNation.com. It's that easy. Website is becoming faster, more mobile, friendly, more, uh, let's say, let's just say behind the scenes, it's becoming to look like a real web web page. Uh, <clears throat> right before the end of the year, there's all these analytics you need to look at and so forth. I haven't done it. You know, I ain't got other things to do. But I decided to take a peek. <clears throat> and then it gives um, a rating of your podcast. And I was a D minus, whatever, whatever that meant. And I go, well, I can't be a D minus. You, know? you can't have that. That's close to an F. So we started uh, to look on how to make the website better. So, of course, we've changed logos, and we've got new theme music and all that other stuff. That's podcast-related, but the website, we started making it faster. So when it downloads, it downloads a little bit quicker, and some uh, security measures and something with the spam. and So we're starting to add a whole lot of stuff to it, and now we're up to a B. So that's, that's pretty good. We, we did that in a couple of weeks. So proud of that. That's right out of Google's analytics. So our numbers will be going up there as well. As well as our numbers are going up in the podcast. And we're always thankful to the audience for listening. Now on program notes, we were going to have Mr. Fields here today. But because of some last minute moving around the chessboard, Mr. Fields could not be here, and uh, we have uh, put that a little bit further down in the end of the month, but we're going to have the show. We'll uh, just stand by for that day. So we brought up the commission case. The commission case is going to go hand in hand with two episodes, which I will link on the show notes. Episode number one, Rico, because... The commission case is a RICO case. And it will always also go with the Hell's Angel MC podcast that we recently did as well. Because, as you know, the Hell's Angels were charged with a RICO case. But this case is dealing with the La Costa Nostra in New York City. The five families, Bonanno, Colombo, Gambino, Genovese, and Lucchese, and how the de- how the Justice Department decided to go after them with RICO. And we'll discuss that in full detail. So we have a lot to talk about that. And um, I'm also going to be doing a little bit of uh, the programs of what we're going to have. So some of the shuffling on the board here 
is going to introduce us to upcoming shows for the month of uh, February, because this is our last show in January 2020. So coming up in February, uh, February 5th, it's time to merge federal law enforcement. And that's out of the Think Out of the Box series, episode 125. That's right, I said it, merge, merge. And I'm going to give the reason why it needs to be merged. I think merger and law enforcement, period, is way overdue. But the federal government, it's way, way overdue. February 12th, episode 126 is going to be The Club, part two. Remember, I did uh, episode 109 of The Club. Some people took interest in what I was talking about, wanted to know a little bit more. And I chose from episode 110 all the way to the end of the year of 2019. I think uh, it was December 25th was the last show. I did ten, uh, five or 10 minutes on an overview of of the club, expanding a little bit more of what we discuss. This will be part two of that, about 40 minutes. I'll be talking about the club and then we're gonna put the club to rest. Until when, kids, remember I, I gave you a hint. And I'll just say that it, will, it won't be for the next three and a half years. But that show, that's the one you get popcorn for. That's the one you want to pull up a seat. So the club, that comes up uh, February 12th, February 19th, episode 127, Why Rico? We're going to continue on the series of Rico. Here we're going to examine what happened to just the regular indictments and getting evidence and what, what's so special about Rico. We'll talk about that. And we'll wrap up the month of uh, February with uh, February 26th, episode 128, Coffee with a Cop. And for that show, I'm actually going to have some active cop here to discuss this topic with us. And of course, we're going to be uh, standing off on the rest of the, uh, the month uh, episodes for now. Mr. Fields will be uh, further down in March. So, where are we now in this country when the president of the United States is being impeached? Now, I know there's a couple of people out there, not known, not many, but there are that are rooting for this thing to be completed. Some very young folks in America actually believe that the moving company will be pulling up to send the president off. But then none of that's going to happen. This is all political, savvy, symbolic, but it's also a huge amount of BS. Not only are you charging somebody without a statute of what they did wrong, or in other words, the actual crime, you're list of witnesses is tarnished and you're trying to get some witnesses that you yourself being the Democratic Party refused to call them in the Congress. Now you want to call them in the Senate. So game after game after game and of course shifty shift never to be outdone has gone up in front of as the uh, what is it the manager isn't that the position of the impeachment and I can uh, did his impersonation of Pinocchio. So, it's a freaking joke. They should be getting slammed pretty hard in this next election coming up. They're an embarrassment to the country. Now, for you guys that are still diehard Democrats, my first, my apologies. Second, snap out of it. And third, it's a shame what they're doing because the country's not thinking like they do. I'm sorry, folks. You're, you're, you're way off on this one. Okay? The, the, the Ukraine thing's a hoax. The Russian thing's a hoax. It's all a hoax. You're holding up the gravy train. That's all I'm saying. And like I said last podcast, and I'll repeat it today, Americans are getting pissed off. 
the we the people, they're getting pissed off. When they get pissed off, somebody's got to pay. And that's going to happen at the ballot box. All right. Lastly, uh, I'm having, again, some couple little hiccups with my dad. I had a drive down to Miami the other day to take him uh, to the hospital for what we thought was going to be just a simple procedure, and it got complicated. And next thing you know, I had to take back off. I had to take off and come back up here, and uh, he was going to uh, just do a simple X-ray. That's all it was. Relative was going to take him, and then it's just one catastrophe after another. The relative could make it. Uh, my dad went and drove himself. They did the x-ray. They didn't like what they say. They admitted him. Car was in valet. And, uh, and the story goes on. Stayed there two days. And um, Champ's back at home. He was admitted the day before his birthday, his 86th birthday, and released uh, real late at night, too, which is almost a rarity for hospitals. Close to 930, he was released on his birthday. So uh, Champ is still hanging tough. And my last comment that I want to make about is, I don't know about you, but i got to put this on the table. Fast food. One, it isn't fast anymore. Have you ever, have you tried to get a chicken sandwich at Popeye's? It's an outing. I mean, it's a weekend thing. You go on a Friday and maybe you'll get it on Sunday if they don't run out. It's a joke. It's an embarrassment. The management of that company should be ashamed of themselves. You can't put out a freaking meal in the fast food market that you have, the concept of fast food. You might as well just pack it up and, you know, make a restaurant out of it because you got people waiting in the drive through over a half hour to 45 minutes for a freaking sandwich. Isn't that ridiculous? At this, at this stage, it's ridiculous. And then sometimes you get, like happened to me, you get to the front and you ask for the chicken sandwich and they tell, oh my God, I should have told you. We, we ran out. So the, the run out nonsense is going on too. Now this is what really kicks me in the pants. You ran out. But tomorrow morning, the delivery truck will not be there. People will start ordering chicken sandwiches and they showed up. So somehow, all these imaginary chicken sandwiches showed up. So it's a game they're playing, and I'm not playing with them anymore. Not only that, other fast food, they can't figure it out. You Simple orders. Simple orders all screwed up. And you owe $15 an hour, $15 an hour, and they can't figure out a simple fast food combination. We're going to hell in a handbasket if we keep this up. All right, up next, the word of the week. Then Samuel took a stone, and he set it up between Mitzvah and Shin, and he called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped. Thus far, the Lord has helped. As always, you can get Test Everything 1521 on RadioCopNation.com. Loads up every Wednesday like the regular podcast that you listen to on RadioCop Podcast. And uh, it's 15 minutes or less of the power of God for your life to heal you, lift you up, encourage you, save you. Whatever your needs are, God has spelled it out. And what we do is this exact same word that I read on that later different podcast episode. We explain what we read and uh, during this show, during that show. So look forward to that. And then I just read from 1 Samuel 7, 12. So there you do. If you want to know more about it, Test Everything 1521, and you can go to RadioCopNation.com. There's a section there that says Test Everything. Type on that and scroll down, and you'll see uh, the word right there. The, those podcasts last 90 days on the Test Everything section, and then they erase. But we know that the Word of God never erase and is prepared 
for such a time as this. Okay, it's time to get our friends over from the circus. No, 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 calm down. I am not talking about the Democratic Party and Shifty Shift and all those clowns. These are some other clowns. Episode 124, the commission case. When we're talking about the commission, we're talking about the Mafia Commission, La Cosa Nostra, in New York, the five families, Bonanno, Colombo, Gambino, Genovese, Lucchese. And the government is appetite to bring them all supposedly to justice. We will examine the biggest case that the government has ever thrown at the mafia and how it did not remove it from the face of the earth, but it sure did cripple it enough. And we'll explain all that much more in a lot of detail. We got a lot to talk about here. So as I said earlier, this podcast, the commission goes hand in hand with Rico and with Hell's Angel. Uh, MC, which also they were um, charged with RICO. And so we're going to put all that together. And then we have another show coming up in the future of, I believe, the month of February, which is one of them is uh, Why RICO? And so all those four episodes, well, they're going hand in hand. But today we're talking about the commission. And it starts off with Joseph Bonanno which was, of course, a founding father, like he says, father, of the Bonanno crime family in 1931. He was placed as head of that family, and, of course, his family tree goes uh, way back also as uh, leadership in in the mafia. And uh, Joseph Bonanno, and I believe we discussed it in the Bonanno series, he basically, during the 60s, from 31 to like 63, 64, is leading his family. He's the father, the father of his family. And uh, then he runs into a problem with the commission, and they're trying to strong arm him. And uh, he kidnaps himself, I think it was. And they basically, the banana wars break out. And as a result of that, um, he does come to an agreement with the acting commission of the time, 60, 67, 68. And he agrees to retire. He retires to Arizona. But here it is, the year 1983. And Joseph Banano has decided to write his memoirs. And one of those, uh, a part of that memoir is, starts off on page 145, and it's titled The Commission. The name of the book, A Man of Honor by Joseph Bonanno. And this episode, or this title in uh, Chapter 3, The Commission, is very interesting to the gov- government. Uh, we start off with the RICO statute, which is Racketeer Influence Corruption Organization Act, also goes hand in hand with Title III of the government rules and regulations, better known as laws, that deal with recording bugging devices on people. 
they've kind of put all this sandwiched in between the middle, and you get a Rico sandwich. Now, one of the things they want to do with this specific case is put recording devices and the history of the mob, right? Because remember, in RICO, you want to have at least two or more predicate acts ranging from a time of 10 years that, that this criminal entity had grown or people in it had grown as a result of those crimes that were being committed. Remember we discussed also in RICO, you really don't need dates and times. All you need to do is do a historical chain of events. And so this is the case. The government, after the inception of RICO, shelves it for about 10 years supposedly because uh, prosecutors didn't know how to deal with it. Hogwash, that's baloney. I think that the government didn't know exactly how to approach it, yes. But any prosecutor can pick up the rule book and say, I got it from here. I don't think that's the case. I think the case is they didn't know who to hit and punch first with this because the cat was going to get out of the bag. And they did a trial run. And that first run was in 1979. That's part of our prior podcast that we had with the Hells Angels. And remember one specific techniques that the Hells Angels attorneys used where they adamantly confirmed the government's case and then the government proceeded to lose by saying, yes, we are a motorcycle club. Yes, we're outlaws, one percenters. Yes, we pay dues. Yes, we have criminals in our group. But the group is not a criminal. And the government could not prove that. And therefore, the government lost their case in 1979. They won some other little victories here or there, but they screwed up the the RICO because they couldn't convince a panel of of jurors that beyond a reasonable doubt that the Hells Angels group was a criminal enterprise. Yeah, they got a bunch of people, but that's not the whole group. So that made the government spin its wheels. It basically took another four or five years um, to kind of throw this in. Now, they did throw one at the Gambinos and remember the waterfront, and they were kind of successful. In that. Not as big as they would like to, but nevertheless, they're starting to get their feet wet on the Rico. But this is the big banana. Now we're going out the high seas. We're throwing some chum overboard, and we're looking for some large bait because we're going fishing, folks. And they're going for the five families of the New York City La Costa Nostra, better known as the Mafia. They go out and they're starting to put all this history together. The government, as we said, waited 10 years to mastermind this because I actually believe they were looking for the right combination. And that combination would have come in the form of Rudy Giuliani, that was the U.S. prosecutor. I think that this RICO statue was originally placed in mind, the mindset, the creator, although Blakey, which is the creator of RICO, denies it. Right, this is not about Italians with files at the end of their name. Baloney. But I, I, they're trying to cover that up. They stick a federal prosecutor that's Italian. That's what I can say about that. I think when Rico was developed and created, it was thinking about the Italians of organized crime specifically. But they won't, you know, they're not going to tell you the truth. They're just the government. Okay, so we move on, and we told you this deals with the five families. We know what they're Now, one of the things that the government's going to put together is that the criminal enterprise, better known as the commission, is a ruling body, the board of directors of the mafia, and all five families sit on it. The 
head or the boss or the father of their family sits as the boss and they have a chair on the commission. As a result, one of the things that they would do is construction taxes. So cement, sheetrock, all that stuff was controlled. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how they controlled it in a minute. And it was a 2% tax. So let me give you a little example. Let's say you're building a $50 million building. Well, the government uh, was going to get their fair share of whatever taxes were there. But so was the mob. They're going to get their fair share. And it was a 2% tax. So that means you had to cut them a check of a million dollars off the 50. And they were going to chop that up into five bits for the five families. And, of course, you got to grease a couple of wheels here and there to keep it going. But that's what they were doing. This is one project of many, many that are happening all throughout the city of New York. You want to collect your garbage? you got to rely on the La Costa Nostra, the mob. It's influence in unions. They're controlling it. And you're going to have to pay the piper. The garment industry, the waterfront, the Fulton fish market, meat produce, everything is controlled by the mafia. Okay, so you're probably wondering, how do they get in control of so many things? Well, here's something that might shock you. You know, it would have shocked you many years ago. A couple, I don't want to say many, maybe two years ago. But today, it's not probably won't even phase you. But the FBI, under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover, refused to acknowledge the existence of La Costa Nostra, better known as the Mafia, during the age of 1931 when they were incepted. They had 26 mafia families, and J. Edgar said they did not exist for a period of 32 years. Now, what's even more mind-boggling about that, the New York City Police Department, Chicago Police Department, all these major city police departments are saying, I don't know, but I got a bunch of guys with vowels at the end of their name, and they're committing crime, and I think they might be connected to each other. And there's J. Edgar Hoover and his pumps saying, nope, that's a myth. They don't exist for 32 years. During that 32-year frame that the federal government really refused to acknowledge them, they grew, and they grew heavily. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't play one on TV. I only do it on uh, some podcast. The If I was the government, well, if I was the, the mob lawyers, One of the defenses that I would try to create is J. Edgar Hoover's denial of 32 years. Feed it to him on Sunday twice. All right? So the mafia's got their hand in everything. So let's talk about some of the players. First one up is the Columbo Bulls, Carmine Persico. Okay, now during the time of the commission case, he's already in jail for some other things. I think he was serving a four-year term. So, you know, they're not going to have to go out and get him. He's already in prison. Paul Castellano was which <clears throat> was the boss of the Gambino family. Paul will start off in the case, and then he'll he'll have a different appointment setting place for him with two gunshots, and that's the end of him. He's killed during the commission case. Tony Ducks Corallo, boss of the Lucchese crime family, Fat Tony Salerno, alleged boss of the Genovese family. And uh, Ralph Scopa was a soldier in the Colombo family. He's charged with Rico, too, because he was the construction guy that he went around telling the companies about the 2% tax. And uh, Scopo's job was to make sure all the families got their equal cut. And uh, the Bonanno family, of course, was Rusty Ristelli, the boss, but he's in prison too. And the government, on this case, decides to put the Bonanno family on the shelf. Now, during this era, you had just recently had uh, Donnie Brasco, which was the FBI agent that infiltrated the Bonanno family. 
that that scenario just had happened, as well as uh, a couple of killings and some other things. So they're they're a strange uh, breed to have uh, because they have a lot of evidence on the banana. So the government decides to try them differently. That's one. Number two, I'm sure on a lot of these audio tapes they had, they were picking up the other four families talking about the bananas are shelved. They don't want to deal with them. They're toxic. They had an FBI agent amongst their ranks. Get it? They placed on the shelf, you know, don't talk to us. Don't, you know, you do what you do and we'll do what we do. And they lost their seat on the commission pretty much. So that's why they're not included in the commission case. Duh. All right. So the government's looking at how all four families or five families work together to spell out their conspiracy under RICO. And we know what the rules are for RICO. Just close your eyes and shoot the darts. You're going to hit something. All right. Now, the FBI plays a very important role in all this because they start doing their tapes and their recordings but for the first time, the FBI decides, no, 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 we're not going to have one person in charge of this five-family investigation and then try to put it all together in an office. We're going to do task force, and each family has its own task force. So Lucchese, task force, Campino, task force, Genovese, task force, you know, you get the drift on. So everybody had their own task force bringing in evidence and how that evidence intertwined between one task force and another identified the family. Go back 10 years, predicate act, get the players together, boom, you start building your RICO case. So off the, the, uh, the United States government goes to prove all this shenanigans. Now, the FBI had a you know, kind of install these bugging devices. Now, one of the first bugging devices they did was on Tony Ducks Corallo, and he was named Ducks is his nickname because he would always duck indictments. But uh, Tony wasn't going to duck this one. He had his driver, Sal Avellino, which was a captain of the Lucchese family, and a.k.a. better known as a blabbermouth, pick up the boss with the Jaguar and they would drive around New York City just blabbing, blabbing, blabbing about commission business and construction business and this and that. As a result, the FBI placed a bug in the Jaguar, and they got done. The Columbos were holding court in a restaurant on the same table that was reserved, and nobody could sit in it. Nobody wanted to sit in it because it was highly bugged by the FBI. That's how they got that information. And that's how they screwed over Ralph Scopo, which was the soldier in charge of construction. 2% tax. Remember that guy? Well, he was going to these meetings, so he was done. Paul Castellano, they broke uh, one into his house, acted as TV repairman for the cable, installed one near and around the kitchen. There's where he would hold court. And uh, Paul was um, going to be embarrassed soon enough. And the toughest one to pull off was the uh, was the Genovese crime family, because Fat Tony Salerno had his social club down in East Harlem, and he didn't. There was a twenty four hour watch on the social club, so when the doors closed and Fat Tony went back upstate to his uh, big town home. He had a couple places you know, throughout the city, too. But he'd go home the rest. Uh, there was always somebody watching on guard inside that building. But one day, out of the benevolent of Fat Tony's heart, he decided to take the detail off the social club because it was Thanksgiving and they would resume back on Friday, giving the FBI enough time to install a bugging device there. They picked up uh, Tony the following week. And, of course, the Bonanno family has been left out 
of the pudding, and we'll explain why in a minute. Well, we kind of explained, but there's more. There's more. There's always more, kids. All right, so under the RICO, they have to spell out how the uh, organized crime families work together. Not separate, but they have to be working together. So they're off to create that in this uh, indictment. A Man of Honor, written by Joseph Bonanno, entails how the commission was made or created in 1931 under Lucky Luciano. In order to have peace, the commission was created, according to Bonanno in his book, to deal with financial disputes and territorial disputes between families. They were also ruling on killings. Who got killed, who didn't? And there was a very high degree to give those orders to. It wasn't, they didn't take it uh, uh, by chance. Uh, you know, they really put some thought into this. Now, Banana writes this book, and the third chapter of the book is titled The Commission. I have the book right in front of me. Have it, I've had it for many, many years. And the book on its faith value is a little bit on the boring side to read. Um, but because it's not, you know, very, and then he took out the gun and I shot him and it's not that kind of book. It's very detailed of what he's talking about, but a lot of what Bananos talking about is ancient history too, you know, the thirties and stuff like that. Now, how do you get this book into a Rico? Well, they have, they try to get Bonanno to come in, not willing, they were going to subpoena him. But he clamored up and ended up going to, to prison on contempt of court uh, somewhere out in Arizona. He never comes in to, to do the uh, commission case. But in his book, he details the commission's responsibilities. Now, Bonanno was a charter member. And during the 1985 commission case, there are no charter people alive. Gambino wasn't a charter. He came later. Genovese came later. Okay. Lucchese was a, was a charter member from 31. He died in 67. Colombo wasn't a charter either. And Persico had nothing to do with that. He won. So he's a living legend. He's still kicking. Bonanno. And he's a charter member. So nobody dared to even go near him. And nobody even thought, anything about he was writing his memoirs. Nobody really cared in the mafia. But it did spark the interest of the Justice Department. First of all, they wanted to verify what they had known at that point by reading the book. So uh, a young attorney picks up that book and starts enjoying it by the name of Rudy Giuliani. And uh, it propels the case forward. February of 85, Giuliani announces um, a lot of uh, issues with the FBI and uh, the possibility of indictments coming, but it's leaked out, and the mob guys know it, and then the FBI kind of gets worried and scared, and they send out task force and teams to go start making these seas of rest. Um Somehow, the, it got leaked out. And we all know in Washington, that's an, almost a possibility. Actually, uh, shifty, shifty. It's a, nothing ever gets leaked out. All right. And uh, we, we, we spoke about Banana refused to cooperate at that point. So Giuliani can only read from the book during this uh, commission trial. Uh, Big Paul Castellano pays $2 million to be on bail. And uh, he's enjoying life on bail, but he's starting to get pissed off of all the information he's finding out. And he's embarrassed as hell because he's on those tapes in his kitchen. And he's doing things he shouldn't be doing and talking about things he shouldn't be talking about. And it's an embarrassing situation. So to lash out, he blames all these troubles on one guy by the name of John Gotti. Now, why that happened was because Gotti's crew is being charged with heroin 
like his brother Gene that ended up doing 30 years. And they were in his crew. Now, I believe that, you know, Gotti did eventually kill Paul Castellano, and he sits in the chair. But here's a guy that was a mid-level or maybe even lower mobster, and he challenges Paul Castellano, which is the boss after after Carlo Gambino. And I actually believe that the underboss at the time, De La Croce, actually put him up to it to a certain extent. While he was alive, he told him, hey, the boss is the boss. Don't you get it? But I think there was green lights. And somewhere in his mentorship to God, he told him, He's, you, either you whack him or he whacks you. When you get the sign that he's going to come after you, you got to get him. And that meeting in Sparks where Paul Castellano was put to death was to deal with that same issue. So as he pulled up to in the middle of Midtown Manhattan to get a, a juicy steak and a juicy story, he ended up getting some juicy bullets and died. And John Gotti was thrown in the mix. Kind of messed up the government's case because without a defendant, he's in a uh, pine box. That's not going to really do very good. Okay, so there was a lawyer on the team and for the Lucchese crime family. And in September of 86, now we're almost coming to an end towards the case. His name was Samuel Dawson, and he did some research, and he researched the Hell's Angels case, where they openly admitted that, yes, this does exist. There is some type of influence in, in, um, in corruption, but it's members, not the entity, as we told you. That's how the Hell's Angels were very effective. He tries this, and he's defending uh, a gentleman by the name of Salvatore Tommy Mix San, Santoro. And he's the underboss of Lucchese Grand Family. And he says, yeah, look, the, 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 the mafia exists. So for the first time, they actually make an admission of that. Now, this was a runaway circus for all these defendants, which was a total of eight of them. All of them had lawyers, and some that were lawyered up for two and three. And there was no defense. I mean, it was like, what do you want to do? What are you going to do? They tried to put a happy face, but they couldn't agree on anything. And to make matters worse, Carmine Persico, boss of the Colombo crime family, decides to represent himself. Now, a lot of legalists laughed at that. And, of course, if you have yourself as an attorney, you're a fool. But Carmine was extra special because he got to look and threaten the witnesses on the cross examination. So it had some a little bit of effect. I mean, at the end they lose, so you know, it didn't work. All right, so moving right along, <clears throat> the guilty. Who got who got found guilty? Fat Tony Salerno. He was seventy five years old at the time, got slammed with a hundred years. That was the end of Tony. Uh, from the Genovese crime family. Tony Ducks Corral from the Lucchese crime family was 73 at the time, got hit with 100 years over his head, and that was enough for Tony Ducks. Carmine Jr. Persico was 53. He was probably the youngest out of all of them. And uh, he was in prison like four or five years prior to that. He got 100 years. He ended up dying March of 2019 at the age of 85. So, and uh, Carmine would run the Colombo family from behind bars. Uh, the sentencing was done by federal judge Owen, and he basically said that the, all the defendants had eligibility of parole after 10 years on the federal law. He also hit them with fines ranging from 50000 to 250000 which today is chicken feed. And uh, other sentencing, because remember, it's not just these guys, the bosses, some other people. Anthony Bruto in De La Canto, 39, from the Bonanno family, was given 40 years upside his head at the age of 39 for killing Carmine Galante, which was at that time the boss of the Bonanno family. 
And but that was a commission approved hit. So they had to tie that in. So he got he um he got hit with um, forty years, as well as uh, and then uh, Anthony Bruno and uh, Lacato is also the son-in-law of Jimmy Burke from the movie Goodfellas. Okay, so that way they played the the, the schmuck uh, Robert De Niro played him in the movie. Okay, other people, uh, Jerry Lang, Langjalia of the Colombo uh, uh, Colombo family underboss. He was 48. He got 65 years. Uh, Ralph Scopo was 58. He was Colombo soldier. Remember, he was in charge of construction. He ended up getting an, uh, a nice little package for him, about 40 years. Salvador Tommy Mix Santoro was 72. And Christopher Chris Trick Fernori, they the consulary of the Lucchese family. They're both from, from the Lucchese family. They both got 65 years upside their head, too. So the lawyer thing didn't work. <clears throat> and Rusty Ristelli, boss of the Bonanno family, was already in jail for other things. Remember, he wasn't tied to the uh, RICO case, but they tried him separately, like regular indictments with dates and times, and you did this and you did that. And one of the reasons they didn't want to tie in Rusty Ristelli to the case was because of the fact that they were just, they were assuming that Bonanno would be compelled to testify. But he decided to do contempt of court, and I believe he went uh, contempt of the prison nine months and ten months. Not really remember what length of time, but Bonanno stayed way far away from the commission case. That's for sure. All right. So 1988 now, everybody's Friday, everybody went off to prison in 86, in November of 86. Here it is, 1988, and the federal government has to make a public announcement that fat Tony Salerno, the Genovese crime family, was sentenced to 100 years, but he wasn't the boss. They finally figured out that the real boss was Vincent the Chin Gigante. So after they threw themselves on the sword and said the truth, there was a motion from uh, Fat Tony's lawyers to get him out, and uh, nah, nah, you know what, he's already there. Man, what the hell, leave him there. Poor Fat Tony, he dies in prison in 1992 at the age of 80, so it didn't work out for Fat Tony either. But he was was a hit, he got hit, he was a butt man, and he's just... The Genovese family was very uh, smart and not identify who the leader was, confusing the FBI to all means. And uh, he he ruled like a like a like a boss. He had a social club, big crew, everything. He was very influential in the family, but he wasn't the boss. And there's one tape that they had of Tony Fat Tony Salerno looking at a list of main members that are going to come from other families. What they would do, the commission would pass it around, see if anybody had any exceptions to these people, if they even knew who they were. And Tony makes uh, some comment as to, uh, ah, what do you want from me? Uh, you know, like he's a little pissed off with this procedure they're using. And he goes, uh, do you know what? Let the boss decide. So he wasn't the boss. Government had to go find out who the boss was, and they did. All right. So my closing thoughts on all this on the commission case was it hurt the mafia. It disassembled them completely. John Gotti, during this case, takes the seat of Paul Castellano. The government now is forced to separate Gotti from this case, of course. There wasn't enough time to patch them all together. And Gotti eventually gets life in prison and dies in prison. So it doesn't work the way that the the government would have liked, and it didn't work out for the mafia as well. So Gotti's administrative style, when he took over, he was, for lack of a better term, a total disaster in La Costa Nostra. And the reason for that is 
He had one rule. Well, he had several rules, but one of them was every Wednesday, every captain and soldier of the Gambino family would go to the social club, the Ravenite in Manhattan, and show homage to him. The FBI had a field day taking pictures of who's who. And this was Blunder 101. Another one was opening his big mouth again about crimes that had already been committed, which was another one-on-one mafia. You don't do that. And he's talking about murders that had been committed and uh, blaming Sammy Gravano for it, and he's coming out on tape. Now, I don't want to talk about what the government really thinks they did. There was a vacuum. The vacuum was quickly filled up because that's the way the system, the La Costa Nostra is built. You might not get guys with a whole lot of experience, but they eventually got in those roles, and the mafia still exists. They don't have the clout they had before, but they still have clout. They lost a lot of it in the commission case, but not all of it. Getting the point? So today the Sicilians come in, and they kind of reformat some of the rules, like why are we killing all these people? Well, they testified against us. They snitched. They had stool pigeons. So they did an analogy, and they said, okay, <clears throat> do you still do it the same way when he was around? Did you change it up? No, we changed it up. So he doesn't know anything at this point. No. And we didn't lose that much. No. And the thing's still going. Yeah. So why kill him? Because now somebody's got to give the order. Somebody's got to do the execution. Then we got to hold them accountable. <clears throat> and maybe one day we got to go find them and kill them. <clears throat> so we're building a bigger and bigger web for ourselves. So the Sicilians come in and they go, we ain't doing that. And that's why you got all these guys. They're out of witness protection. They're just wandering around. Nothing's happening to them because what they were involved with no longer exists or has been modified, and they don't know about it. The people they hurt, they went off to prison, and some of them died, and why are we holding grudges? Bad for business, and they've incorporated. Now also the Sicilians, they brought in something else now. Highly encouraged people that are made members to have their sons, nephews, cousins join as well. If one person becomes a stool pigeon, that whole crew gets whacked, including they threw in family relatives. So now you don't see as much snitching. People are being a little bit more truer to that oath they took because uh, the stakes are higher. And uh, to be honest with you, they're absolutely right about the snitching part. I mean, I, you look at uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano, everything he snitched. If you put it on paper and you put the, the modern Gambino family next to that paper, there's probably nothing that hits the mark today. Nothing. It's, all, it's either been modified or thrown out or it's a new racket. It's a new era. So to put two bullets in his head because something he did 30 years ago, what good does it do anybody? Nothing. Now you got to cover that up. Get the point? So my take on the commission is they still exist. They're not as powerful. We know that uh, recently, as of three years ago, there was another bunch of arrests, and they even had um, uh, skinny uh, Joey uh, Molino from the Philadelphia crime family and some other people said they they were involved in commission rulings and so forth. But it's uh, I think the commission is uh, tr- having difficulty getting it out of its own way right now. And they are meeting in secrecy and they're meeting um, most likely um, on a strict schedule. And, and sometimes those schedules are up to five years. They won't see each other. And they... That's what consularies are there for. You know, you run messages back and forth. So the, the organization is still firm the way it was created in 1931 to avoid in families fighting against families. Now, of course, there's a little thing here and there, but 
the commission has really held the organization together. And they smartly did that in 31 because they were building an empire because J. J. Edgar Hoover was denying their existence. As a result, they're still around today. So, as I said, they're not as big as they used to, but they're still big. All right, so, uh, we, as I said last episode, we have a couple of new items as far as the song of the week. We, we do not. We don't play it on here because, you know, you get that nasty Facebook or um, YouTube letter is you're using copyrighted material, and if you do it again, so but the song of the week is Harry Connick Jr. and Anything Goes, and we'll be placing that on the show notes for you to enjoy. Up next, it's time to merge federal law enforcement, episode 125. As always, it is my honor and my pleasure to be your host on Radio Cop Nation. Continue to pray for yourself because without you, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, your community, and most importantly, your agency that serves you. And always, in these troubled times especially, continue to pray for the United States of America. God willing, see you soon. This is Alpha Mike in a month. Uh, 1322. The Raider Cup Nation.